Welcome everybody. Teresa Shaver here from the Business Advisory Center Durham. I am pleased to have Leon Ephraim from Thomas Ephraim LLP here with us today. He's a member of our expert network and a lawyer that we've worked with for at least five or six years here at BACD. Welcome, Leon. Nice to be here. Thanks, Teresa. My pleasure as always. I know that you have a team of lawyers now and support staff that work with your clients to really help them with the services that they need because you believe in being their lawyers for life, which I love. It means that you actually care about your clients, which I think is really important, right? Uh, you know what? I like the way you say lawyers for life. <clears throat> that could have been something that our uh, new web developers use because I used to like to say cradle to grave. And that might not sound as good <laughs> as lawyers for life. But yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, whether it's uh, managing your business needs, uh, buying your business, creating your corporation, eventually selling or implementing a succession plan for your business, we are able to help you throughout all that process. Right. And, and we, have a, we have a team of experts that we also, you know, rely on when it comes to things like tax and uh, and uh, insurance and those kinds of things if our clients don't have those already in place right uh, when it comes to real estate you know there's a lot of uh, things that go into that if you're buying your first house you should also be thinking about your first will if you don't have one um, if you're buying your first house and you're having a child you know again you should be thinking about your will so all those things so yeah we like to think that we are thoughtful and mindful of our clients needs and will recommend we won't uh, we won't push anybody to do anything they're not ready to do but recommend that uh, they look at the various factors that go into a long happy successful life ah good i'm glad to hear that for sure so um as part of our expert network leon is one of the lawyers that we definitely refer our clients to um our clients run into all sorts of issues around you know wanting to register a corporation a partnership agreement service contracts all that sort of stuff so um you know here at bacd is we strive to be the go-to business resource for businesses here in the Durham region uh, we've been around for 20 years now and we're one of 53 offices in Ontario. Our mission is that uh, entrepreneurs we serve achieve business success. Whether that success is somebody who's on ODSP and they really just want to be able to have their own business and uh, they've taken a hobby that they've had and turned it into something where they feel that they contribute, they work with customers, they offer value. Or if it's someone who wants to be a $5 million business, it really doesn't matter to us. What matters is that you achieve business success and that for you, that success could be, as I mentioned earlier. So I'd love to ask you some questions today. Um, I know um, we had talked about you know, a whole bunch of questions when I met with you last, and uh, I wanted to go through some of those with you. So I want to ask you, I know that uh, you were working for corporate firms for a while, or even in-house counsel mm -hmm. for a company, and then you decided to start your own legal practice. How come? Like, what inspired you? Well, uh, you know, I, this, is, this is not a story that I'm uh, embarrassed about, but th the fact is the wealth management company that I was working for, uh, ran into some difficulties and ended up having to uh, fold their tents, so to speak. And, uh, but through my involvement with the company, I had met many uh, very interesting business people uh, who had asked to retain me outside of uh, the wealth management company once, once everything was done. And so from there, uh, I, you know, it all came on relatively suddenly. Uh, and uh, I, I stayed on during the windup, and during that time, I acquired several very interesting corporate clients, mm -hmm. and uh, things worked out so well that I didn't even bother looking for a new job. I decided to go out on my own. Right. What do you love about being your own boss? Being my own boss. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> being, being my <laughs> own boss. So... Um, you know, I think it's probably easier to say uh, the things that are challenging about being the boss, but yeah. it's always best to be your own boss. Uh, I, I don't know that there are people that enjoy answering to other people. 
or, or, or taking instructions or orders <laughs> from other people. So, you know, I, I mean, and this is how your clients know me. This is how you know me. I'm always honest. And that's the, the honest truth. It's Very always good. best to, 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 to I, I mean, of course, if you're someone who's not motivated and, and not able to manage your time and, and force yourself or, you know, I, during those times when you're per, perhaps not even particularly motivated to work, uh, being your own boss means you have to. And, and I would say um, one of the questions you know, that, that I saw on the list that I was to look at is, you know, what makes you a success? And I, I would say that, uh, you know, the best answer would be fear because there's no safety net. Right. So, you know, uh, when, when everything happened, the story that I just told you, everything that happened with the company that I was in-house counsel for, I was still relatively newly newly wed with a young family and uh, had people depending on me yeah and so making the decision that i did was was scary but but i had no uh no option to fail right my husband says that too about being in his own business is like failure is not an option this is yeah. it this is what i have to do you he's know? right he's right and you know i look at the market today uh, you know, I look at people in my peer group that are losing their jobs, you know, and they spent their time in middle management or in government or even as senior management. But, uh, you know, so actually this probably makes more sense about why I love being my own boss because yeah. I'm going to work for as long as I want to work. Right. Nobody's going to tell me when it's time for me to, pack up my desk. You know, uh, I mean, the, the, the public might, that's up to the clients, but, yes. but, but, but no supervisor or manager is going to say, you know, it's probably time for you to retire, go fishing or do whatever. I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, work till I decide I'm not working. Do you like fishing? Yes. I don't do it very often and I'm not sure I'm very good at it. But I do enjoy it when I get to do it. It's all it is about is sitting quietly, waiting for something yes. to bite. Yes, I, I mean, um, <clears throat> I've never been particularly good at cleaning the fish I catch, which I always thought should be a skill you should have if you're going to do the fishing. I, I mean, I love lake fishing, fishing for bass, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, and but every time I have to catch, when I occasionally catch a fish, which is not often. <laughs> When I occasionally do, I have to use like a Google, a YouTube video to clean the fish because my wife won't do it. And in fact, nobody in my family will even eat the fish, which is okay for me because I cook it up and eat it all myself. <laughs> That's okay. So um, I grew up in South Africa and in South Africa, the, the motto is always, if you kill it, then you eat it. Yeah. And you, so you clean it and you eat it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and then you eat it. So if you're going to go, the intent is, is that you don't just kill for, for the reason, for no reason. Oh, of course. You, know, you don't hunt. Like I never did any hunting per se, but um, certainly I killed some birds, but then we'd have to skin them and eat them and, and wow. fill it. And same for fish. If you wow. caught a fish, yes. So we were taught how to fill it a fish and make it all come out pretty nice and neat and look pretty, you know? I'm and not going to lie. I've never killed a bird. And I, I think if someone ever told me that I had to, you know, clean and, and, and skin the bird, I'm not sure I could do it. It's tough. It's not, for me, it's not that easy to do it even with the fish. <laughs> and I think, I think the bird would be even a little bit harder. Yes. Um, well, I grew up on a farm too. My mom actually used to do the chicken. She used to, you know, catch yeah. the chickens and go through that whole process. It makes you appreciate your, you know, where food does come from. Um, I mean, totally off topic here, but I always see a, used to see ads in the paper for a kitchen, sorry, a chicken catcher. Oh, really? You know, from, for chicken farms. And I would, I would think now, isn't that just the most awful job to have to catch chickens so that they can, you know, become our food? Anyway. Well, I had an uncle who had a, a, a chicken farm, but they weren't food. It was an egg farm. Ah. And, you know, I was there once or twice when I was a kid 
Chicken catching is not an easy thing to do. <laughs> it's not easy. Even in an enclosed space, they're not easy to catch. And, and, you know, I remember coming back and telling some family members, and they just laughed and laughed and laughed. But my uncle that owned the farm, yeah, yeah, he sent me to try and catch a couple chickens. And it was not easy. I You'll get bitten. I, I don't think I even succeeded. They, were even, they only bite if you get your hands on them. I couldn't even get my hands on them. They were, they were too fast for me. So the, the process at your at your family's farm, would you catch in that? Would it be like a hatchet to the head, or would it be like a neck twist? <laughs> Either one, they did. Yeah, yeah. Back then, yeah. I've seen, I've seen the neck twist on TV. Yeah, it's not not very pleasant, honestly. Listen, I eat chicken. I don't think I would. I, I don't think I'd be offended by it. I don't know that I'd be able to do it, but you know. That's a good point. Um, I have a question for you, just when it comes to your business, um, how do you market your business and what have you found to be the most successful tactics for you to use? So um, word of mouth is, is number one. So yeah. treat your clients well and they will pass people along. I, it's, still, it's still difficult to gauge what methodology people use to find the lawyer that they're gonna work with. So, because I think we've moved from a time where even I was a kid and everyone was raised that, you know, there was this hierarchy of professions, doctors, lawyers, politicians, dentists, and they were all right. respected. And, and, and you were simply to respect them by, by virtue of the fact that they had entered into this vocation, had gotten the education to do it and were, considered to be there to serve the public. Yes. In 2000, in nearly 2020, it's pretty clear that people have gotten past yes. this uh, blind idol worship of lawyers and doctors and politicians. But still, in many cases, you'll find uh, children who use the same lawyer that their parents use. Uh, yeah. When they buy their first house, when they look to get their wills, um, you know, Lately, we do a lot of estate work simply because demographics are such that there is uh, uh, more population leaving us than joining us at, at this time. And so, right. uh, and so if their parents did their will with us, their children will likely use us to help them with the estate. Right. In terms of, in terms of other marketing, um, the internet mm -hmm. is, is critical. So, and I can say that because we uh, we moved offices, by the way, so everybody knows. We're now at 50 Richmond Street East, Unit 110. We used to be at 28 B Albert Street. We moved in January of this year, and it was a move that came after almost 20 years in the same location. Wow. And while we've been working on marketing while we were there, people just knew who we were by virtue of my partner or my partner's yeah being in Oshawa, born and bred, and, and having had an office there for some 40 years. Um, but I noticed shortly after the move, within two or three months, when the spring was coming, that we had lapsed in our marketing. Uh, we hadn't got the word out properly that we had moved. Right. Uh, we, we had people that were coming to the other office. And I noticed that we had dropped on our placing if someone Googled real estate lawyer in Durham. Oh, okay. And so we, 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 did, we renewed our efforts. We uh, revamped our website. We hired a, a, or we're working with a company that uh, the company that revamped our website has actually moved it. So, you know, now if you Google real estate lawyers Durham, we come in the first three in that little sweet spot. on the right. menu. Uh, And so I think, I think the internet has a, a lot to do with it. And then, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at real estate is, is the part of the business where you want to mass market. Yeah. So there are so many old methods. Uh, if you've ever been looking at a house, you know, you get that folder and all the lawyers advertise on the various pages of the folders. Right. That's actually an expensive way to market. And I don't think it's very effective. Yeah. So we've partnered up with, uh, a few law, uh, a few real estate agencies, although we work with all real estate agents, but the agencies that want to work with us, we're always happy to sponsor their events. Yeah. Uh, we did a lunch and learn for the BACD 
in, yes. in, uh, in early July that had 50 real estate agents there and we were just going through how to complete the Aurea form with them. And so those kinds of things, uh, sponsoring a real estate agent or an agency's golf tournament, that kind of thing. Yeah, so those um, work, right? And then last but not least, you know, um, we're considering a mail out because we have a bunch of flyers now. And so, you know, or an insert in one of the local newspapers because it never hurts to support those uh, businesses as well. And then there's joining the expert network. Yes, thank you for mentioning that. That, that, that you know, I probably should have mentioned that first, but, <laughs> but you know, I mean, BACD has always been very good to me, always referred people to me. And, uh, but now <clears throat> that you formalized it, I think it makes it a, a more attractive means of, you know. Marketing yourself. Yeah. Yes. And I like it because it's a small team of experts now that we yeah. have in that network. Um, and we have a process, but we also have a selection criteria. And then we can also offer you as the experts some exposure to our mm -hmm. clients and opportunities to connect with those kinds of businesses that need your services, right? So Absolutely. this is a win-win for us too. In fact, there's one of your uh, one of your sessions, or maybe it's a meet and greet kind of thing yeah. that I plan on going to, some sort of lunch thing yes. you, make, you guys plan right here. I've never been to one. But you I should come out. I think next, the one you're doing next month, I think I'll be attending. Right, that's our business lunch, and we'll have it at Jack Astor's in Whitby. Yeah. So we split between Whitby and Ajax, so next month yeah. is uh, Whitby. And so people can come out. It's, it started out being like a low friction, casual way to meet people and network. It's not really, you know, come out and like pitch and sell. It's no, come no. out and build yeah. relationships. Have right? some lunch, yes. have, a, have a drink and, and just meet people. That's One of these it. days I'll convince you to do it, do it out here in Oshawa at some point. <laughs> well, I would if there was a Jack Astor's. It just happened to be a partnership that we... Oh, really? Do they like, do they, like what, what, what does Jack Astor's offer as a partner? They offer us an, an opportunity to host at their location. <laughs> so, you, so we're paying for the drinks and the food and everything. So they just offer the opportunity to host. Yes. Do you have another restaurant in mind? There's a Wendell Clark's that just opened up around the corner from here. Oh, yeah. I could probably use that type of opportunity for sure. Oh, maybe I should go and talk to them. You should. Well, you're right. Because we don't have that space sat empty for a long time. And a lot of people thought that would be a good location for like, a Jack Astor's or one of those big box chain restaurants. And then uh, Wendell Clark's came in and fi you know, filled the void and yeah. you know, they, they deserve to perhaps give, give, give it some consideration for- I'd meeting. like to. Tell me, have you been there? Yes, the food is good. Okay. Now good. Wendell Clark's yeah. must be part of a big chain as well, no? Yeah, well, there's, there's four or five of them. So it's okay. not a huge chain, but you know, it's, uh, it's growing. I'm always happy to consider. Um, the only reason it was Jack Astor's is I was introduced to their managers. And um, I mean, I enjoy working with them. The people enjoy the food, but why not share the love, you know? Absolutely. Spread Absolutely. it around, for sure. Um, another question I have for you. Um, do you see any coming trends in your area, like in the legal field that might impact your business and, you know, might impact your customers? So there's talk of letting paralegals do uh, real estate deals. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, this is not new, but a lot of, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs are DIYing their legal requirements. Sure. Uh, for a long time, I now see a lot of people using their accountants to create corporations. I, I mean, all of these things are... Um, choices. Yeah, they're, they're choices. They're... You know, I, I grew up, my father owned a, a garage, a gas station, a garage. And so uh, his favorite day was the day when somebody would come in and say, you know, someone from the neighborhood would say, how much will it cost for a tuna? And my dad would say, well, what kind of car is it? And he'd say, well, you need six spark plugs. You might not need wires if you need wires, et cetera, et cetera. We'll change the cap and do whatever. And so it might cost you, I'm, I'm dating myself now, but you know, it could cost you two, $250. And the dad would say, wow, I can do it myself. My dad would say, okay, 
And then the guy would inevitably, well, not inevitably, but quite frequently show up, you know, three or four hours later with a half a spark plug in his hand. And, you know, I, I just broke the spark plug in my manifold. Now that just made my dad stay because even at that time, you know, it would cost a thousand dollars to repair the, the error you made trying to do it yourself. Right. So it's like that old commercial, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. So uh, the simplest one I can use is I have a lot of people who use their accountant or just go online to create their corporation. Right. What's wrong? So what happens when they do that online? Because I mean, even us, we're getting all these apps that you can give to clients well, they yeah. can find it themselves and they can register their business on there. I mean, I'm not a fan of it at this point, but. So registering for your business license, I, you know, that, that is meant for everybody to do. The master but, business or, license, which is a yeah. sole proprietorship, right? But, yes, but, we but, help them but, with that. But, but what people do with corporations is they file their articles and get their articles and that's where they stop the process. Right. They're done. But that's not the end of the process. You know, you need to create what's called a minute book. Right. Without that minute book, you have no way of telling the story of this corporation. You know, you have no history, you have no records. And uh, whenever you're audited by CRA, WSIB, or even have an investor looking at your company, they're going to say, we want to see your corporate records. That's when you're going to come to someone like me, because the accountant's going to say, I can't do that for you. And, you're, and, and if you did it yourself, you're going to be like, I don't know how to create a minute book. A minute book? What's a minute book? Those are your corporate records. Right. Those are your constating documents. The documents that actually tell. So when I say just filing it is not the end, it, you know, you still need to create these documents to give the history of the corporation. What type of documents are you talking about? Uh, director's resolution, shareholders resolution, shareholder registers, director's registers. Now, I mean, I, I, perhaps I shouldn't be discussing all these things because now I might encounter a bunch of people doing their own minute books afterwards. Uh, but those are the kinds of things that are typically in your minute book. Right. You can discuss those things. I mean, it's not just that. There's also corporate record maintenance, which is well, a fairly that, onerous process. But that's what your minute book is. Yes. Corporate records. And, and but I mean, the maintenance is, is relatively simple. I, 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 don't, I don't think I have, uh, I take any exception or issue with the company trying to do that themselves because your accountant can file your annual return when they file your taxes. It's just ticking a box. And yeah. your annual resolutions are pretty simple. So, you know, uh, but it's the actual original minute book documents right. you know, that are, that are, you know, something that are not necessarily boilerplate. And, yeah, good point. You know, and, and my only other concern with people creating their own corporations is that they don't necessarily create the proper uh, share classes and mm -hmm. share provisions for what they want to do. So when it comes time, perhaps, for them to do a rollover for tax reasons or issue shares to family members or their children because they want to try and, uh, you know, they, they want to try and profit share to reduce taxes. Their, their articles of corporation don't allow for that. Right. And now you're paying $150 filing fee plus whatever you're paying the lawyer to help you file those mm -hmm. articles. Mm -hmm. Whereas a, a good corporate lawyer, or a, a, a corporate lawyer that has experience would normally uh, just as a matter of course uh, create your corporation to include several different classes of shares, shares that allowed for any potential tax planning like rollovers or the potential investment for non-voting shareholders or issuance of shares to family members mm -hmm. you don't want them to have any voting control, but you want it to be able to, to, to sort of income split so, right. yeah. so um, I totally agree with you. I mean, here at BACD, we don't register anybody's corporations for them. We always send them and we send them to a lawyer first because a lawyer is schooled in corporate law. Well, a corporate lawyer is. An accountant is schooled in 
the book, the books, the accounting yeah. of a corporation. It's not necessary the legal ramifications of it. Yes. So, so I mean, I leave it up to people. They do what they need to do. It's their decision, their business decision. But certainly, oh, we want to make sure that they cover themselves, and especially when it comes to these kinds of issues, right? Um, and then if they want to end up and want to end up selling the company and the corporation, all of those, if it's not set up correctly, it's not something that's simple to do. Um, I've noticed it's not something that's simple to fix. Yes, yes, exactly. It's not simple to fix. It's a spark, broken spark plug in a manifold. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> and and, and I, I find a lot of things are like that. Um, yeah. You know, interestingly enough, I, uh, I was consulted today by a BACD client who uh, wants to work up some service contracts yeah. and has found a website. I mean, I get it especially for startups, things are cost sensitive. So the idea was uh, perhaps I can put together a draft and you'll look at it and tell me where I've gone wrong or where I've gone right or what I need to change. And I'm not actually bothered by that. So I think uh, this brings, this sort of brings me full circle back to your original question, which is I think now the practice of law is much more collaborative with the client right? then the way I, I, I remember seeing my dad when he was dealing with his lawyers. And then when I was a junior or right out of law school, mm -hmm. seeing lawyers dealing with clients, it was a lot of, you know, lawyers saying, this is how you're going to do it. And, you know, don't bring me your thing uh, because I'm just going to tear it apart and it'll be like, you're starting from scratch with me. And I think, uh, the process now uh, is becoming and will continue to become uh, far more collaborative where, it, 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 you know, you're not necessarily drafting, but you could be consulting saying, right, right. Good agreement. And, but, but perhaps you should consider this or change that. Or right. uh, if, if you want to change that, I will, you know, provide you with a possible template clause that you can use. Right. So I think that's probably, one of the things that's changing. Right. Um, I know with our clients, we have some la sample agreements that we use. And um, we always say, you know, show up or ask a lawyer once you've done your homework about what you need. What do you need in the contract? What eventualities do you need to cover? Here's a sample of things that can, you can be covered for. But make it easy for yourself and cheaper by showing up and doing your homework of what you need the lawyer to do for you. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. and so that makes it much easier from that. that well, and you don't, you don't always have to work with the first lawyer you encounter. Yes. So, you know, some, again, um, like anything else, change doesn't happen immediately and it's always generational. So um, I'm sure, you know, that approach, would not um, be particularly uh, useful with, say, you know, a lawyer who's been practicing since the early seventies, sure, or you know, or, or the eighties, simply because they're they're stuck in their ways. They do things their way, hmm. and you know, when it comes to agreements, uh, templates are always a good thing to work with. But you know, you know, you're doing it right if you're using your template. Yes. So you're not always saving money by developing your own template because myself as the lawyer, if you give me your template, now I have to look at it from the very beginning to the very end to make sure you haven't gone wrong in, in certain areas. Whereas if I'm using my template, you might actually be saving money because I know where changes need to be made and, and what information needs to be included. So right. perhaps, you know, before you go down the path of creating your own document, you, uh, just like this, uh, this client of yours did with us today, before she went down the path of creating her own, she, you know, wrote to us and, and asked. So I think that's a, a, a good approach. Yes, I would agree with you there for sure. Um, if you had the chance to start your career over again, would you do anything differently? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so that's a good other, other than take over my father's business instead of become a lawyer? Uh, <laughs> no. Um, yes, I would do a few things differently. Um, I would have probably started my own business a lot earlier. Yeah. And so if I had to whittle it down to one, we all have things that we would have done differently. But when it comes to my career, and if, if the choice isn't, gee, what do you want to be other than a lawyer? So if it's, how would you, what would you do differently in your career as a lawyer? I would have uh, opened my own practice a lot earlier. Right. And I would have uh, sought out, you know, senior counsel uh, that I could either partner up with or whose practice I could purchase much earlier. Because uh, it's a very difficult profession to become proficient at. Because everything's changing all the time. It, well, but it's difficult to become proficient at it if you're doing it all on your own. Yeah. And, you know, my partner and I both say that, boy, it would be interesting to see how things would have turned out if he and I would have met, you know, 15 years earlier. Yeah, good point. When I was, when I was spending time working for, you know, downtown firm or working for wealth management company, if if I had been engaged in my own practice and perhaps even met him or someone like him who knows yeah you exactly very good point um what piece of advice would you give to someone who wants to start their own business uh, there's probably more than one piece but do something that you love yeah and you know have a thick skin yeah be ready, be ready to, 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 to deal with a lot of uncertainty. Yeah. And a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of fear. But if, but I think that's why the two go hand in hand. If uncertainty you, and fear. Yes. Well, no, I, I mean, but loving what you do, it's okay to be afraid and uncertain if you know you're doing something you love. Yeah. You know, and, and, Succeed or fail, uh, which is really, in most cases, a very slim margin of, of one thing going one way or one decision made differently. And, uh, but in the end, you know, you can't blame yourself for doing what you love. And chances are, if you're doing what you love, you'll likely, uh, if you're not already good at it, become good at it that's and true you know, and so if you're willing to persevere because you know you're doing something you love and you can manage the fear and uncertainty that's always in the back of your mind then i think you'll be successful yes it's not for the faint heart that's for sure no you know no. um what acti key activities would you recommend that entrepreneurs invest their time in now, when you look at the skill sets you need to run a business? Um, honestly, I would say networking. Yeah. Number one, um, you can be trained to do a lot of things, but if your business is always going to stay at a certain level where you're the master of everything, you know, you're doing your own bookkeeping, you and your spouse are the receptionists, and there's no admin staff, anything like that. But if, you're, if your staff's going to grow, then you have to develop an understanding of all the roles and then make sure you hire the right people. Very good point. I was actually interviewing uh, the CEO today of Mitchell & Whale. And he's grown that little insurance broker from three people to yeah. 60. And we were talking about that as like, you know, have an understanding of the jobs that you need to source out or hire for yep. but don't be the one doing all those jobs there's no so, way the business is going to grow without that you, you know that's why there are accountants that's yes. why there are lawyers that's why there are now internet and seo companies or that's why there's a bacd thank but, you <laughs> but in the end you know you should understand what what each role does and uh you know staffing is is critical and I wish I could say that I've been perfect on that front, but I have not. 
I don't think everybody can be. It's, you know, no, but, but sometimes the, it's the school of hard knocks. The mistakes that I've made in other areas have not been as troublesome, shall we say, as mistakes that I've made in the area of, of staffing. Yes. Or, yeah. not, or not paying enough attention yeah. to my staff. Yeah. You know, um, I, uh, I, I think you get caught up with the minutia of the day-to-day, -day, the day-to-day -day operation of the, biz of the business, and you're not really looking at the people that are working for you and, and, and asking yourself, <clears throat> does that person look happy? Does that person seem like, you know, are they going to be someone that's perhaps going to, are they looking to go somewhere else while they're sitting there, you know, at the desk? Uh, um, are they taking advantage that, you know, there's no real, nobody really to supervise them because your expectation is that they can govern themselves in terms of doing their work and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And so, and these are all I think difficult skills to acquire if you if you if when you're new to being an entrepreneur. That's true. That's true. Um, that's one of the things I worry about is you know having time to actually be with my staff and to coach my team and and to show them how much value they bring to me and yeah. to, to our brand and to BACD is yeah. I often feel that I can never actually show them enough how much I appreciate them and how much they do for us, you know? Yeah. Um, I can only do little things and I'm constrained by my time, you know? I. Well, because even, th even things are simple like planning staff events. I can't, can't get to it. It's hard. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, you know, this summer, uh, you know, I officially took over this practice almost four years ago. This summer, I had the staff over to my house for a barbecue, and it was the first time we had actually had, you know, a staff event. Mm -hmm. So, you know, now now we're already working on something for September. Like, you know, we might go axe throwing or or whatever because it's close by. Yes. But but we'll keep it local, and it'll just be a get together. And you know, uh, it's interesting that offices of certain sizes um, create difficult scenarios for socializing because yeah. you know if you've got an office that has 20 people you know there's going to be a group of four or five that will go out for beers at the end of the day on friday or go out for lunches on fridays or every second friday kind of thing when you're just a staff of you know eight or nine people and every, and, and everyone's moving and on the go there just doesn't seem to be time or inclination for those kinds of things. So true. So I think when you're smaller, you need to maybe ha make a bigger effort to to create uh, that culture of yeah. celebration, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, one of the things I did. You remember Ryan used to work here? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Years ago, I made him the chief happiness officer. Okay. So he had to come up with like all the ideas of what we could do as a team. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we had a lot of fun with that. Stuff? Did it come up with any good stuff? Oh, it was just different things to do as a team. That was fun to do. So we yeah. would do all kinds of different things. I mean, the hard part for us even here is, is that everything has to be after hours because we are a service-based organization. And so very seldom, the only time we're not here for someone to walk in is if we're all at an event or something going on. But and, and you're right. Again, because of size, because of size, you know, if you try to do something during the day, like at lunch, it means somebody has to get left out. Yeah. You don't want either. No. So, you know, so I'm starting to get the hang of, of that part of it, you know, as well. Like I said, all these things take time because, you know, I think that if you don't do it after a certain amount of time, the little the little cuts and bruises that people acquire along the way from each other in the work environment, they start to add up and, yeah. and then, and then, and then relationships become challenging and, yeah. and you know, perhaps even ir irretrievably poisoned. And so by doing this, you at least let people, uh, 
and it's up there amongst themselves right and it's tough i will say that the three advisors we have have all been entrepreneurs and so those are very similar personalities yeah and so you've got to be able to work with them and to bring out the best in them you yeah. know um i'm i honestly i think every day i'm so very very lucky i get paid to do what i love and to work with people i love working with i, I mean i certainly can't complain you know we get um, to put together fun programs and yeah, it's always do. a group model which is always fun and so it, yeah there was a time where we didn't do the group model time because you know i remember um when i when i when i've done sessions for your groups you know, the thing that always strikes me is that these people have been attending these sessions often enough that they all kind of know each other, yeah. you know, and they become friends. So when a question comes up or a topic comes up, you'll have one of them saying to another one across the room, across the horseshoe, you know, I think that might be relevant for your business. Cool. Um, Joe Smith. And, and I always thought that, you know, these are the kinds of things, uh, you know, it's weird because it's not, it's not like it's a, a full-time educational program, but that's, you know, school and learning also involves making these relationships. Yes. And you'd be yes. surprised how many, it, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there are B, BACD relationships. They are. Clients that have lasted for years. They are, for sure. I mean, we didn't always use the group model. So for the first few years, up until, I mean, I got here in 2012 until 2014, we stuck to the one-on-one -on -one model. And then over time, we started to grow at such a rate. Mm. Now we see 5,000 entrepreneurs a year. And there's just no way we can do it on a one-to-one -one model. Yeah. And that's when we started to develop these group models where people, and, and also I think it's more, two heads are better than one. So I think it's more powerful actually to be in a community with other like-minded individuals that are going through the same processes and yeah. have the same challenges and the same things that are going on in their businesses and even to some degree, the same kind of business. So for me, it's way more powerful to bring us all together than to try and work by ourselves. And I it's think, a lonely think, game, as you know. That's a good point. No, I think it's a good point. I think it's a great point. Yes, yes. So to wrap up the interview, I'd love to ask you, who has been your greatest inspiration? Wow. Mm hmm. God, this is gonna sound so sappy. Um, well, you're a human being too. I uh, I tell everybody that will listen that the best thing that ever happened to me was when I met David Thomas. Oh. So even um, the wealth management company, I was doing well. Uh, you know, I was doing corporate work. I was working with developers and EMD. And my practice looked like it was, it was really going to thrive. But I had not, I wasn't, I wasn't the same person that I was when I went to law school, the day I started law school. And then, uh, then I met Dave. And he just showed me that, you know what, it doesn't have to be all uh, aggressive and uh, impatient and go, 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 go. And, you know, he brought me back into working with just the community, you know, working with people who are just buying their first house or having their first child or, you know, doing their first will. And it just was life-changing. Right, very cool. And so, yeah, I would say David Thomas has been my biggest inspiration. That's and awesome. Also, he works so hard to do good works in the community. Yeah. Um, I call him my boy scout. <laughs> he, really, he really is. And uh, so, yeah, I'm proud to work with him. That's a neat, and I mean, the two of you still work together and oh, look yeah. after, like, do you do real estate and wills yourself as two or? So I, I do, I do a bit of everything, but, but you know, my corporate stuff keeps me pretty busy. So we have Michael Wooderson who uh, joined us last year, who does a lot of the real estate. And then we have uh, an artisan student who works with us one day a week named Anna Hicks, who uh, helps out with wills and stuff like that. I and do know Anna. Oh, you do? Oh, was she yeah. ever in BAC? She was, years ago. Oh, she was cool. looking at doing some crafts. And then she told me, you won't believe where I am. I'm working for 
for Leon. And I said, yeah. oh, that's wonderful to hear. Well, it's been like two years now, but uh, no, it's, it's gone okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, but Dave and I, uh, he's a sounding board. Yes. He, uh, he now it's, we've gotten to a point where he does the work that he wants to do and is just here. He's like of counsel. He's here to help, uh, the juniors learn, help deal with, help put out fires when, cause in yes. real estate, there's always fires. And then he's here to work on big projects because he is likely the most expert real estate guy um, that is that is humble and doesn't work on Bay Street. That's so cool. There's, he gets, you know, he gets calls from the most unlikely sources to untangle really messy real estate situations because he just, he thrives on it. He loves it. He just like the challenge, huh? I mean, oh, the funniest thing, you should have seen him trying to teach me how to read a survey, which I'm not going to lie. I'm still not fantastic at. But <laughs> he, he, can, he can break down a survey as if he was trained to be a surveyor. And we have a filing cabinet. He collects them. Like people collect stamps and comic books. <laughs> he, has, he has a filing cabinet that might hold about 14,000 surveys of homes in and around Oshawa. Wow. So then he's got something to refer to if, if he needs. Well, that's it. It's so it, you know what he says. So what happens is if, if somebody wants to buy something and the vendor says, we don't have a survey, Dave will say, well, let's check and see if we already have it. And his, and his biggest fantasy is to try and find a way to monetize this. You know, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure if there's a way for that, but. Uh, oh, that's very cool. But you know, whenever he wants to teach somebody how to, uh, how to read a survey he's he's the guy when we did the lunch and learn he was front and center yeah and and the comments we got back from drawer were just spectacular that's good to hear you know yeah. that's good to hear well leon i really appreciate your time it's been very fun very interesting my pleasure i enjoyed it as well to talk with you and uh, i look forward to being able to see you at one of our seminars again where you're Thank you.